Good morning and welcome to this Wellbeing of Women webinar, Let's Talk Pelvic Pain. My name is Leslie Regan and I'm the Chair of Wellbeing of Women, the only charity that funds every aspect of women's healthcare from cradle to grave. And I'm delighted to welcome everybody to the platform and also to introduce you to my very special guest this morning, who I think you're going to really enjoy hearing from. Now, just before we start a little bit of housekeeping, the webinar is being recorded um, and we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to access it at a later date and the team at Wellbeing will help you um, access that if you wish. Uh, we're using the chat function for comments and questions and I'll do my very best to get through as many questions as possible. Uh, I want to also thank the Financial Services Compensation Scheme and Bolt Burden Kemp who supported our webinar series and just reminding everybody on the platform today that we have a webinar about once every month. So please tune in on a regular basis. And if you've missed one that's special, especially interesting to you, you can always access the past ones uh, because they're recorded and on YouTube. Now, I just want to very briefly give you a, a quick warning that in this webinar, we are going to touch upon links between unwanted sexual trauma and pelvic pain. And there will be signposts in the chat for you and on our website, signposting you to the NHS website uh, where you can receive um, advice and help if you find that that is a trigger for distress. It will only be a very minor element of this very important webinar about uh, pelvic pain, but we thought it was important to state that. Now, I'm going to introduce uh, my guests today. I have two very eminent doctors, Dr. Lucy Whitaker and Dr. Lorraine Harrington. And we welcome particularly Hannah Virtue, who is our patient voice. So as those of you who visited us before on this platform, you know, we always have an expert and a patient voice who I would say is the patient expert uh, in this particular uh, scenario of our webinars. So um, let me just quickly talk about Lucy for a few moments. She can, um, she can blush now or whatever. Uh, Lucy is a clinical lecturer in obstetrics and gynaecology and she's based at the MRC Centre for Reproductive Health in Edinburgh. She's in, still ongoing her training as a clinical lecturer and she's a lead for the clinical studies within the EXPECT team at the University of Edinburgh. And the EXPECT Centre is a BSGE, so a British Society for Gynaecological Endoscopy recognized specialist center. And Lucy is specializing in endometriosis surgery uh, and minimal access procedures to minimize the trauma that women who have uh, pelvic pain and endometriosis undergo. And she's also a bit of an expert in the menopause. So she's a multifaceted uh, clinic, clinical doctor and we're very delighted to have her here. Um, and then I'm going to, inter well, I say, Lucy, why don't you just tell us what EXPECT stands for? Because I, um, I, I failed dismally to get what all the P's were. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leslie, for that kind introduction. So EXPECT is about excellence in pelvic pain and endometriosis care and treatment. And it encompasses both our clinical care for patients within NHS Lothian and the wider Southeast Scotland for complex endometriosis and pelvic pain. But we're also within the University of Edinburgh and very much looking to find better treatments for patients. And that includes both discovery science, so identifying and understanding pelvic pain and endometriosis, but also bringing about new treatments and better evidence for our existing treatments to manage both endometriosis and pelvic pain. Great. So I think you can see, audience, that Lucy is a pretty good expert to have here. Um, she's actually st standing, as you will see, in her scrub. So she's obviously been about to She's either been doing some surgery this morning or she's about to do some this afternoon. But thank you, Lucy, for giving your time to us. We're always very grateful for the contributions you make to Wellbeing Women, and we're delighted that we've been able to fund you in the past with our research grants. Thank you. I'm going to move on to Dr. Lorraine Harrington, who is exactly the sort of person that one needs to have involved in this when we're talking about pelvic pain, because um, Lorraine is not just a consultant in anaesthesia, but also specializes in pain management. And she's um, the specialist uh, or clinical lead for pain medicine at NHS Lothian. Um, and she's uh, also um, very strongly attached to the EXPECT Pelvic Pain Clinic in Edinburgh. 
um, in addition to uh, practicing at other centers. And I think that what Lorraine is probably going to share with us is her passion about equalities in healthcare and addressing the imbalance within female pain conditions. And I think that's what so many of the, um, the um, people that contact us at Wellbeing talk about, about how they're not listened to. Um, and when they are, they're told, well, that's normal, you have to get on with life. Uh, and how some women are provided with superb care, like I would suggest those that turn up in Edinburgh, but that's not the case in every city. Um, and so very much dependent on the quality and the leadership of those centres as to whether women get looked after in a way that we would like our sisters and our daughters and our mums looked after if we had this particular problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk to, well, she's going to talk to us about it, actually. I'm not going to introduce her with the background. I'm going to turn now to Hannah, who's probably our most important guest, and ask Hannah to share with us, as she will, um, her experience and her journey. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Virtue. I am 32 years old and I currently live in Edinburgh, Scotland with my partner. I've lived here for about eight years now after finishing university. My gynecological diagnoses are neurological chronic pain and PCOS. And I'm here today to share my experiences and my pain journey with you all. So just to give you an idea of the kind of pain that I have, um, it's predominantly in my lower left pelvis area. The pain can range from a dull ache to sharp stabbing pains, and I can sometimes experience a burning sensation type pain. Occasionally, it will move over towards the middle of my stomach and sometimes round into my back. I do also sometimes get pain down the front of my left leg, which can make it really difficult sometimes to do things like walk, move, get out of bed, etc. Just a little background on myself and how my pain has been over the years and my journey to a diagnosis. So pelvic pain has always been quite a prominent part of my life. I remember when my, when my periods first began, they were very heavy, very painful. And it was actually around the age of 16, 17 that I experienced a ruptured cyst on my left ovary, which required me to have surgery. Thinking that this had actually been a contributing factor to my pain, I hoped it would then ease and I would be able to go on with normal life. I eventually began trying various contraceptives to try and manage the heavy painful periods, which found that my periods were stopped, but my pain was continuing and was actually becoming more frequent, more intense, and was predominantly on my left side. I spent many years in and out of hospitals, doctor surgeries, repeating that I was in constant pain and I had no idea what was causing it and just hoping that someone would help. I went through multiple blood tests, antibiotics, painkillers, scans, but never, never given a reason for what, as to why I had the pain. I was eventually offered a laparoscopy to look at the possibility of endometriosis, but at this point, my weight had actually increased and I was often being told, if you lose some weight, your symptoms will ease. Um, and following the surgery, I was told that there was no signs of that and simply advised to lose weight. My pain, however, did continue and I kept on going to the doctors as I knew that something wasn't right and the impact that this pain was having on me on my, and on my quality of life was awful. So I was eventually referred to the Expect Pelvic Pain Clinic um, where I was able to explain my story. Each of the doctors present at my appointment took the time to ask me about my pain, the symptoms that I have, the impact it was having on my quality of life, the impact it was having on my mental health and they examined me and performed some tests to try and understand my pain. They explained to me that they would have a discussion and then come back to me. And at this point, I felt the exact same feelings I'd felt in many doctor's appointments before. I thought they'll come back, it'll be more unknown, it'll be more tests, I won't get anywhere. And they actually came back into the room within 10 minutes and said, Hannah, we believe we know the cause of your pain. And I sat in complete disbelief. Um, almost not being able to take in what it was that they were saying to me. And neurological chronic pain stemming from the ruptured ovarian cyst, which had damaged nerves. And I remember bursting into tears during my appointment because I felt so listened to. I felt my pain was being validated. that It wasn't all in my head. I wasn't imagining it. And I just felt so listened to during that appointment. And... The appointment just lifted so much weight off of my shoulders and I'm so thankful to those doctors that I got to see them and I got to have them look at my, my symptoms and be able to give me a reason. 
I was given options on the day of how it could be dealt with and I was prescribed medication that day, which I then started on. I was also offered psychological support, which saw me attend group sessions with the pain management service, which has given me the best insight into understanding how and why my chronic pain happens, how I can manage it. It's helped me to look at who I am as a person away from the pain because the pain had become so much of my identity that it was hard for me to see anything further than that. And it also gave me the opportunity to speak with others who experience pain and to understand that I'm not alone in experiencing this. Just um, some information on how my pain impacts me. So on daily life, it is made very unpredictable. On days when I have little pain, I can go out walking, I can go shopping, I can travel. But if I do too much of this, then that the pain then increases and the following day, I can often really struggle to do basic tasks like getting out of bed, getting dressed, cooking, things like that. My work can be impacted on days when I have bad pain. It can make it difficult to concentrate. Often I'm a bit irritable and tired. I can't sit in one position for too long. So I find I have to maybe take more breaks and it's going to have a negative impact on me mentally because I, I find that sometimes I'll start thinking that I am letting my employer down. I'm not up to the expectations that I set on myself. Pain can also impact the type of clothes that I wear day to day. So on a good day, I can wear jeans and what I would class as nicer clothing. And on bad days, often I can't bear any material such as my skin at all. Working from home means that I can manage that with things like my leggings, my jogging bottoms, but they can then become difficult when I do want to leave the house. In terms of relationships, I have at times found that I can isolate myself. The pain in the past has caused me to think that I don't want to bother people with it. I'm possibly a bad partner, daughter, sister, friend, etc. because I can't do as much as I want to do. And I might seem unreliable if I'm cancelling plans, either because I am in too much pain or I know that it's going to cause more pain. And the frustrating element for myself is that I want to be involved in those plans. I want to go out. I want to see people. And often I can get mad at the pain and the impact that it's having. I can also find at times that I'm possibly less open to meeting new people um, simply because I feel sometimes I can't commit to plans and I'm, I feel like I'm maybe not the friend they need me to be. It does also have an impact on intimacy. So with me and my partner, we have been together for 10 years now and he's really supportive of me through to getting my diagnosis and helping me in day-to-day -day life. However, as a couple, pain can often make it difficult sometimes to engage in intimacy, either because I'm already in too much pain, meaning that I don't want to engage in anything, or knowing that it might leave me in pain. And from my partner's perspective, he doesn't want to do anything to make my pain worse or to cause me any pain. But it's a conversation that me and my partner am, are I'm able to have, and we are quite open in talking about that. I just wanted to give a little update in terms of where I am now on my pain. So my quality of life now is beginning to improve after visiting the, the EXPECT clinic, thanks to them explaining my pain, the treatment options, and being able to validate my pain. The medication that I take has helped to decrease the pain, and from the pain management classes, I have learned about things like pacing and understanding where my boundaries are when it comes to managing my pain. I have also learned to be more compassionate with myself, creating a compassionate kit bag, where I keep a list of resources that I know help me on bad days. For example, having calming smells, heat pads, crafts, etc. Even the follow-up here that I've had from the Expect Clean Clinic has been great, checking in with me to see how I'm getting on, how my medication is going, how my pain is. And I'm really, really thankful that I've had that as well, just a follow-up to see how I am. And I just wanted to end my part with talking about as somebody who suffers from chronic pain, I know that it can become quite, a, quite an isolated thing and it can make you feel quite alone. And I'm very fed up thinking that there's no help. But as somebody who's in a better position now, I want to share that you are absolutely not alone and there is definitely help out there. And thank you very much.
thank you very much indeed, Hannah. That, that's, I'm sure that's very quite difficult to talk about, and we really do appreciate you sharing with us. And I, I think it's important to explain to or, or to emphasize to our audience um, that one of the big problems with pelvic pain is it often takes a very, very long time to identify what the problem is. Now, one of the questions has been, uh, she didn't, uh, that somebody, Lavinia didn't quite catch the first part of the diagnosis before the PCOS, but I think that was chronic neurological pain, wasn't it? Which yeah. has resulted in a permanent problem for you following the rupture of your ovarian cyst. Yeah, that's correct. Great. Um, so Hannah, am I right in saying that the most important things for you have been being taught how to self-manage the problems? You talked about your toolkit for a bad day, and also you really emphasise the importance of feeling listened to. Yeah, that, that's definitely been um, two key parts for me um, in getting to where I am now, was just feeling validated by by those doctors and telling me that the pain that I was experiencing was real and then being able to to go to self-managing that um I think not having the right tools before meant I didn't know what to do on bad days I didn't know how to make those bad days easier to, to deal with yes. um so definitely having things like the compassionate kit bag where I know that I have tools available that can help me there and then that I can turn to it's definitely been that really important part for me and do you want to just emphasise what the most, those ones that are very, very helpful to you? Because I think there'll be lots of questions yeah. about that from our audience. Yes, yeah, so I have um, sort of the normal things in there to help. So I have heat pads. Um, I have um, some, uh, some I, I have some painkillers, just sort of basic ones that I know I can turn to. But I also have things in there that I enjoy doing. So things like puzzle books, just to try and distract me. Um, coloring books I really enjoy crafts so I have little things in there like little cross stitches or um yeah like like th little things like that that I know will just for a short term help to distract me from the pain right. um and what I also keep in there as I said is the calm and smell so I love the smell of peppermint and it always calms me so I try and keep that in there as well as some mints so that if I don't have the smell I can they taste it and it just I find it just really helps to calm and I, it's it's they've allowed me to look at what it is that I get comfort from um which is really helped that's really helpful and thank you for explaining that because the reason why I asked you to say it again was because I think it's really useful for our audience to hear that it's not one size fits all or it's not one one particular item in everybody's compassionate bag it's actually identifying things that give you relaxation it might be music or a book or as you said puzzles or whatever um, peppermint yeah all of those things thank you and I think the other thing that I probably should have said when I was introducing everybody was that in addition to being the chair of well-being of women I'm also the currently the women's health ambassador for England and you will be aware of the fact that the women's health strategy which was published last year um, consulted over a hundred thousand women well the public consultation went out and 100,000 women, I'm not, I haven't got my noughts in the wrong place, 100,000 wrote in. And one of the top things that they wanted talked about was menstrual pain and pelvic pain. And the, they wanted to shorten the length of time to a diagnosis. And something like 80% of the respondents told us that they'd had episodes in their lives, not necessarily all with pelvic pain, but with other problems in women's health where they hadn't felt listened to by healthcare professionals. So that for me was quite a sort of a wake up call. My goodness, we really do have to ensure that uh, we are listening and that perhaps not even, you know, I think all of the doctors on this call would say, well, we do listen, but then perhaps sometimes we're not good enough at explaining to the patient or the woman in front of us, I'm really listening to what you're saying or finding some way to make her recognize that we genuinely are empathizing with her problem. Now, um, thank you again, Hannah, and uh, I hope that wasn't too stressful for you, but uh, you're one of the lucky ones that have got the benefit of Expect Pelvic Pain Clinic in Edinburgh. So I'm going to pass over to Lucy now, if I may, and I'm going to ask you some rather, rather basic questions, uh, but I know that you're particularly good, Lucy, because we've spoken many times before, at explaining complicated things in a very, very accessible way. So what is pelvic pain? Perfect. Thank you so much, Les. It's no pressure there. Um, so 
pelvic pain, when we talk about chronic pelvic pain, the medical definition of it is an intermittent or a constant pain in the lower abdomen of the pelvis or a woman or those assigned female at birth that's been present for over six months. And it's also pain that's not occurring exclusively at the time of a period or during intercourse and it's not associated with pregnancy. So that's the sort of technical definition. Um, but I think the most important thing when we talk about pelvic pain is that it's a symptom, it's not a diagnosis. And there are many, many factors that can contribute to that, to that symptom of chronic pelvic pain. And we also know that it's extremely common. So we're coming to the end of Endometriosis Awareness Month, which uh, we know can is affects one in 10 women and those assigned female at birth, uh, which is a condition when you've got cells similar to the lining of the womb elsewhere in the body, and they can cause inflammation and are often associated with very debilitating pain. But many more patients are affected by chronic pelvic pain than just those with endometriosis. And we think around about one in four are affected with, by chronic pelvic pain at some point in their life. Now I'm a gynecologist, so in terms of the factors that I look to within my specialty that could contribute to this pain, as well as endometriosis, there's a condition called adenomyosis, which is a, a cousin of endometriosis in a way. It's when you, those cells similar to the lining of the womb, rather than being elsewhere in the body like endometriosis, they're actually within the muscle layer of the womb. And that can cause, again, very uh, significant pain, both at the time of periods and other times, but also can contribute to very heavy periods. And that's a heaviness of bleeding in itself can also further contribute to pain. Some other conditions within gynecology that can contribute, for those who have fibroids, particularly if they're associated with heavy periods, some ovarian cysts can be very strongly associated with pelvic pain, and also individuals have had previous pelvic infection in the past. But I think the patients that we see within our pelvic pain clinic, some, the majority of them have come through those sort of traditional gynecology routes to us, um, and we'll have either, we'll often have had a laparoscopy to assess for endometriosis in the past. But we also see patients that have got other factors that in the past have contributed to their pain. Be that, and I'm going to just share a slide as a bit of an aid memoir so you don't get entirely bored of me talking. Um, but so out with the pelvis, um, we've also got other organs within there, so particularly the GI tracts, the bowel. So patients can have factors such as IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel dis um, disease, or a condition called diverticulitis, which can cause little pouchings in the bowel and associated with inflammation. And all of those can contribute to pain. We also see some patients who have originally had some issues with the bladder, and particularly there's a, a condition that's called, used to be called interstitial cystitis, when you've got an irritation and inflammation of the lining of the bladder, which we now call bladder pain syndrome rather than interstitial cystitis. Also patients have had recurrent urinary infections or a little renal kidney stones that have come through into the bladder, again, can contribute to pain. But we often find that there's, whilst there might have been an initiating factor in a, pel in a pain experience, often that we then get irritation of the both the, those of organs associated, such as the, the uh, womb and the ovaries, but also then we get irritation of the adjacent organs, such as the bowel or the bladder. And that's often to do with sort of the nerve fibers becoming irritated. And I think uh, Lorraine is much more articulate than I am about talking uh, about the sort of nerve component of pain. So um, as, as, as Lucy said, one of the things, and um, Hannah, thank you. I should start to say it's really humbling actually to hear your review of our clinic. Thank you. It, we work really hard to listen to patients and it's really nice to, to hear that. And um, we hadn't pre-warned pre Hannah or given her a script to read out. That was completely, so that, that, that makes us feel really valued. So thank you. And um, flipping back to Hannah's story, because I think this is actually quite important. Um, there is often a triggering event or a triggering cause um, that, that causes a bit of inflammation or irritation within the pelvis. And it can be any of the gynecological, urological or gastrointestinal causes that Lucy's gone through. But what they often then do is cause an irritation or inflammation of the nerves. And they're not damaged per se, they're just overactive and oversensitive. And that produces a very bes specific bespoke pattern of pain that we call neuropathic pain. And, and that's what that was the condition that Hannah is referring to. And that's very classically sharp shooting, burning. And one of the things that's very important about that is you can take away the initial precipitant for it. So your ruptured cyst can resolve and go away, but you can be left with ongoing pain. And for patients, the challenge with that is you can have multiple laparoscopies, endoscopies, blood test results that 
your physician will come back and tell you're all normal, but actually you know that you still have the ongoing pain symptoms. And unfortunately, there is no easy um, blood test or MRI scan that will diagnose um, neuropathic pain. We have to do it entirely on the symptoms that you tell us as patients. And there is a small examination that we can do. And that's one of the challenges that I face every day in, in, in the medical world, trying to work with my other non-pain consultant colleagues to try and encourage them to learn about this condition, but also to manage it. And I tell every other doctor I speak to just about that patients don't go to the GP because you want to know what your laparoscopy shows. You go to the GP because you're in pain. And actually what you want them to do is manage that pain, support it, diagnose it, and tell you what you can do to help improve that, make it better. You don't desperately want to have a laparoscopy and you certainly don't want to just be told good news, the laparoscopy is negative. So I think what we really need to try and do is, as, as, as doctors and healthcare professionals is to try and encourage a shift um, of sort of thought processing um, to try to sort of move away from that model um, and, and look at other ways of managing it. Um, in terms of other causes of pain, as well as the sort of organs that, that Lucy's spoken about and the neuropathic component of it, your musculoskeletal system is incredibly important with pelvic pain. I'm going to use the analogy of a sort of picnic basket. If you think about a little red riding hood picnic basket with the, the, um, with the sort of wooden weave at the front, your abdominal muscles at the front form the anterior wall of that, your lumbrical muscles in your back form the back wall of the muscles of the picnic basket. And then underneath, you've got your pelvic floor. And whilst you've got your bones and your, your, your hips um, in, in, and your spine that form your rigid structure in your skull, so it's your muscles that do all the work of holding everything together. And if you have any sort of pain source or any sort of um, pain that's being generated in and around that region, it, whether it's from endometriosis, adenomyosis, painful bladder syndrome, a urinary infection or, or neuropathic pain, that causes the muscles to go in spasm, causes your pelvic floor to tighten up, causes your lumbrical muscles, your abdominal muscles to have to work really, really quite hard. And we get a referred pain with that. A bit like when you have a headache, you get pain in your neck and shoulders. And so this system is also equally important to try and address and manage going forward. So sometimes what's really important is to, as well as diagnosing your original pain is to piece apart all the other different bits and pieces as well, because that, 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 that's quite um, important too. Um, pain, sorry, the pain nervousing system, the way it works is hugely complicated. Um, and Lucy's put up a couple of peripheral sensitization, central sensitization. The thing that's important, or one of the things that's important is the way the pain messages are sent within the brain has a huge impact on how they are um, appreciated by your body and how, how they're perceived. And there is a junction in your brain where the pain messages meet and transfer. And that is the same part of your brain that's really important for mood processing. The same chemicals are involved in that. And so if you have abnormal pain processing, it's common to lack a, a hormone serotonin. We call that the happy hormone. And if you have low levels of that, you may have low mood or depression. But because you also need that chemical for pain processing, you won't be able to process your pain as well. So the two are inextricably linked. And I think that's also really important to recognize because people don't get depressed because they have chronic pain. And similarly, people don't develop chronic neuropathic pain because they have depression. The two conditions are linked and cross over. And that also is one of my big bugbears that we need to look at and address because I get frustrated when people say, oh, you have pain because you're depressed. Well, actually, no, it's much, much more biological than that and something that we need to address. Thank you, Lorraine. That's really, really helpful. So for anyone who is, would you like to take the slide down now, Lucy? Thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, some of you, I know I see patients who tell me they're in pain and then and say, um, but I don't want to be just labelled as somebody who's depressed. But I think what you're sharing with us now is how important it is if you are a sufferer, that you actually think broadly about all the things that could help. And of course, um, the, I hope the, the audience will understand that you mentioned the drug serotonin and the serotonin, the selective serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors, the uh, class of um, SSRI antidepressant drugs are actually stopping the serotonin um, being inhibited and therefore that's sometimes why 
the antidepressant medication can help those women who've got pelvic pain. As, you, as Lorraine is saying, it's not that because they're depressed that they've got the pelvic pain, but there are two things working along similar sort of neurological pathways. So really important. Thank you for covering all about that. Now, I think one of the other things that we were asked to talk about was um, a little bit about how um, abuse and trauma interacts with this. And Lorraine, I think I'm gonna pass to you, if I may, for a moment, because it's, a, it's, it's often individuals who have had this as a symptom in the past, isn't it? I, I, think, it's, I think it's important to recognize that um, the, by, um, by far and large, the minority of people who have pelvic pain have a history of trauma or abuse. And, um, and so that's important. And it's important to understand that just because you've had obviously trauma, um, you've had abuse, uh, because you have pelvic pain doesn't mean you have this history in the past. The converse is true as well. Um, there are people who have very sadly had previous histories of trauma or, or unwanted sexual uh, experience and abuse, but they don't all necessarily go on and develop pelvic pain. There is, however, uh, an increasing risk of you developing pelvic pain or trauma or abuse. And that's because of the, the, the psychological impact that that has had on an individual. Um, and so often these are a group of people who would particularly do well with a sort of a bigger psychological input into their pain management. Um, pain management in general works best when you have a multidisciplinary input. You need in particular the input of a gynecologist, of a pain consultant, of a physiotherapist and a psychologist. And actually now we think we probably would benefit from dietitians. There's a whole sort of spectrum of team members that each bring different skills. And each individual person, when, when you assess them, should have basically a look at the whole package. And actually what should be presented as an offering is, is which of these packages in particular will that patient do best with or what would they like to engage with as well? Because it's not what I think somebody needs. It's what a patient wants that works best for them. And people who've had previous history of trauma abuse will probably um, do better if they have a bit more psychological support, particularly a bit of trauma work as well. Um, but it is a very small, small minority of patients um, within the pelvic pain sort of cohort that have had, had, had that as a background. Thank you. That's really helpful to set out that scene so clearly. Thank you. So Lucy, um, at the initial appointment, what, what are the key things that you think that um, in primary care that the GP needs to ascertain? Uh, because I, as you know, I'm a great believer in actually, if we, can, if we can help women to understand what they need to convey and the symptoms that they need to talk about, they're probably going to get seen more quickly and well seen and treated more quickly. So, so what should the GP be looking out for and what should our audience as patients be going to tell their GPs, which will trigger the right sort of response and a referral? Thank you. I, don't know, I think it is incredibly challenging for GPs, as Hannah has very clearly articulated, there's the importance to listen to your patients. And I think GPs, when they've got a sort of eight to 10 minute appointment, it's very difficult to cover absolutely everything, but also talk about treatment options, referral options, and encompass that all in 10 minutes. So I think going with a clear uh, understanding the patterns of your pain symptoms. I mean, I as a gynecologist clearly have an interest in endometriosis. So one of the factors I think to engender a referral onto gynecology to assess for endometriosis is particularly how those symptoms relate to a cycle, but other key factors such as pain with intercourse, pain with uh, opening the bowels and relating that to the cycles. I think now there's so many clever apps that allow people to get patients to get much better, much better insight into the uh, cyclicity of their symptoms. But I think also understanding the, it, being able to articulate the impact of your symptoms on your day-to-day -day basis, because if it's preventing you from doing what you want to do, uh, if it's stopping you going to school, uh, if it's stopping you going to work, then what you should be is offered treatment options within primary care, but if those aren't effective within three months, then particularly looking, considering for endometriosis, we should be offering care on omnid referral onto gynecology services. And that's clearly articulated in the NICE guidelines. But I think it's being able to put all of that succinctly together. But alongside that, you, it's also that being articulating what that individual's needs are and where it sits within their other medical conditions, their fertility, hopes for both the present and the future and encompassing all of that. And then that also is reflected in our treatment strategies. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and um, when, when we, can, we, can we move on to treatments then? Because I think we need to 
think about, you know, there's, I know it's almost like, well, how long is a piece of string? Because there are lots of different treatments, but do you, would you like to kick off? And then I'll ask Lorraine to, to jump in too. Hey, absolutely. So, I mean, I suppose from the gynecology perspective, it's about uh, whether or not there's a cyclical component to patient symptoms in, or they've got associated factors such as heavy periods, in which case often a hormonal treatment might be one part of their management just to even out those fluctuations related to periods or to reduce the volume of bleeding. I think the other role I have is looking for factors that could be contributing such as adenomyosis or endometriosis and then what the evidence-based solutions are for those. Um, but within our pelvic pain service, often those patients have already gone through a general gynecology review, had those factors uh, identified. So, so actually my role within the pelvic pain service is just ensuring all those final investigations have all been done. Is there any particular factor that a patient's very concerned about that we haven't looked for? And then managing those hormones appropriately, and then occasionally the role of surgery that we're, depending on what the underlying gynecological conditions could be but actually a lot of within our pain management and um, pelvic pain service is actually more the medical management of pain symptoms as well as those other factors such as psychological support and physiotherapy. Lovely thank you very much so I mean there are quite a few questions about physiotherapy and I think that you'd all agree that that's a really important component isn't it in your multidisciplinary team as Lorraine was telling us earlier and as Hannah referred to uh, when she was telling us about her her, her journey. So Lorraine, can I turn to you? Um, and we want to, you know, I'd like to hear about um, the various other therapies that you, that you would advocate someone tries. So there's a whole breadth of options. And what I think is easiest is if I give you the umbrella headings. So there's the tablet painkillers, the antineuropathic nerve painkillers, and there's lots of different subgroups of those which I think you, we, we brushed on before and um, some of them have side effects some of them don't I think there's an art in working out the right painkiller for the right person at the right dose and these are predominantly the nerve painkillers we really try hard to avoid opioids dihydrocodone tramadol because they're addictive and they cause dependence and constipation which I think of as the enemy of all pelvic pain so one option we often present people is looking at nerve painkillers other things that can be considered for some people, if they have a very specific trigger point, it might be a case of offering an injection therapy to that, either a one-off injection or specifically a joint injection. Um, occasionally, we can give them a nerve painkiller as an intravenous infusion. Um, that may be more appropriate. Um, sometimes we can have patches, topical capsaicin, lidocaine patches. There can be creams. And that's the sort of medical component of it. Other treatments um, that are actually really important, physiotherapy, and I joke in our team that our physiotherapist who is excellent is the most popular member of the team because she absolutely works wonders. And you get physiotherapists and you get excellent physiotherapists the way that you get you know, good doctors and excellent doctors. And it's really important that a pelvic physiotherapist works with, with, with these patients because they have a very different approach. And then we have we look at things like psychological approach, the pain management program that Hannah spoke to us about. It's actually about living well with pain, because very often we can't completely obliterate pain. And that in itself, um, it's, it's not so much the pain that's the problem. It's the ongoing impact on emotional well-being. It's the ongoing impact on relationships. It's that fear of, well, I don't know if I want to go out to the cinema tomorrow night because I might not be up to it and my friends are going to get really annoyed with me because I'm cancelling again, so I'm just not going to go, which can then lead to this horrendous spiral of, well, I just won't go out at all and sort of, I don't like who I've become. So that is really, really important that we look at how to sort of support people with that. And we we believe in our unit that the best way to, is a, it's a compassion-based approach that we take. And then in addition to that, there's some evidence forthcoming about the role of dietary um, impact on pain. And there's a big link at the moment that we're very aware of between the microbiome, which is your gut bacteria and pain. Um, and we um, there's there's not a specific diet or dry or that has been identified with a big evidence, a big robust evidence base that says this is bad for you. However, we know anecdotally and from preclinical trials that cutting out certain food groups can sometimes help. And I think that's a nice avenue for patients to explore because it's very different to the tablets or medication. 
Um, so we talk about what we call a FODMAP diet, which is a very, very exclusive diet cutting out just about every known food group. And that's quite difficult to adhere to. So what we recommend is you pick one food group at a time, like dairy or celiac, and you try having three or four weeks without that just to see how that impacts on the pain. And as well as actually helping, that's a really empowering strategy that we can give to patients because that's something that we can give to you to help you manage yourself. Um, so there's a whole sort of plethora of different avenues that we can explore, depending on what actually suits an individual and, and what individual preferences are. Thank you very much indeed. Now, what about work? I mean, what can you do if you're um, a busy, busy at work and how, how, you know, how can one mitigate those debilitating symptoms there? Lucy? Um, so I think this is actually one of the few, I dare, dare I say, silver linings of COVID is actually it's reinforced the importance of, of flexible working and how that can allow patients to live better, live well with their symptoms and do what they want to do at work. So I think that opportunity of working from home has allowed patients to be more flexible. So if they're having a flare, they can actually have a couple of hours where they're either going to do some sort of low impact exercise or have a short sleep and work later on but also I think those factors such as things like TENS machines heat packs can all be incredibly helpful and I think people often feel less less self-conscious using those types of things at home but I think there are now many discrete models that people can use in the workplace but I think that importance of pacing uh, is, is hugely helpful and I think that flexible working has helped I think now, now also all the work that's been done with understanding these chronic conditions affecting women's health be it pelvic pain, be it endometriosis, be it the menopause. I think workplaces are now becoming much more understanding of the need to be accommodating to their employees, to allow them to continue to functioning with the work within the workplace. And actually, if that's done, we can keep these individuals within, uh, within the workplace. I, mean, I keep going back to the examples of endometriosis, which I appreciate is just the ice, tip of the iceberg. But the treatment costs of endometriosis is similar to diabetes. But actually, the much bigger expense of endometriosis is that it takes patients out of the workplace. And that's why it costs the UK economy £8.2 billion a year. So all these adjustments really help. Yes. And I'd say that's even that even that bit, bit is, a, is a COVID uh, gift, really, because I think with the, with the massive expenditure of COVID, everybody's thinking about economics now. That's perhaps not, not the right way to run a health service. But if you can come up with reasons, for example, why the menopause program has been so successful, because I think people have suddenly woken up to the fact if you know if you don't welcome women at that particular age in later life back to work um, or make it easier for them to work, you have a massive drain from the economy. So I think it's a really important point. Lorraine, the bit about the FODMAP, because I've had several patients recently who have followed this, and it sounds, as you say, really draconian a diet, but it's had miraculous effects. So well, what, what are the what are the key ones? I think one of my latest, the last one of the last patients I saw was telling me about this, said that when she stopped eating her cup of tea with lots of milk and went on to black tea and didn't eat the banana in the morning, that things were greatly changed. Yeah, it's, I think, um, so the different dietary groups are the sort of common ones that you would think about, like dairy and gluten and a celiac diet and then processed foods and sugar. Um, there's another group that you must forgive me because I can't remember the sort of formal name, but it encompasses things like onions. Um, and um, the, there's another one with things like lentils and pulses. And there really is such a variation. And I, I sort of always recommend it with intrepidation because I think it's unrealistic to expect to adhere to it. And obviously, we just need to be slightly aware that we're talking about a female population. We don't want to sort of trigger any um, eating um, issues and things. But actually, if it's done in a sort of very specialist fashion, whereby you just cut out one group at a time, you know, for three or four weeks. And I think you need to do it for three or four weeks and then gradually re-add it in. I think that sort of, um, you know, makes a difference. And it's weird, currently it's it's the thing in our business plan at the moment that we are pushing to get a dietitian within our, our pelvic pain service because we've identified it. We don't know enough information. So we're trying to push to get that. Um, there's other anti-inflammatory food groups. Turmeric is the most common one that's, that, that there is a reasonable evidence base for um, that is anti-inflammatory. And some people find that high consumption of turmeric helps. And you can buy turmeric tea from Holland Barrett or other sort of health shops. You can buy tea bags, you can buy capsules. So these things all sort of help as well. And again, they're nice avenues to explore it if medication, tablets, surgery is not a, a, an avenue that somebody wants to go down. And the CBD as well? Um, uh, um, question about it, that's why I'm putting it down. Uh, uh, um, about that, Lorraine. 
Yeah, I, I think um, the jury is out. Um, I think that's a whole other three hour seminar. Um, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. And there seems to be a lot of people making a lot of money out of it as well. Yeah. That's good. So for our audience, let's stick to the evidence based um, dietary adjustments. Well, just so just on CBD, sorry to follow on that. Um, I think there anecdotally, we do have patients who are reporting using it and some of them derive benefit. Um, in terms of actual uh, documented evidence in randomized trials, we don't have that evidence yet. There is some really interesting what we call preclinical models, so laboratory models of endometriosis, that actually CBD does look very interesting, but I think we've yet to have a good evidence base. And I think what I would say is that what we're interested in is some of those chemicals contained within cannabis, such as CBD, but actually cannabis itself, firstly, it's legal, but secondly, in those of reproductive age at risk of pregnancy, there's clearly a lot of very adverse um, consequences from using cannabis, particularly in terms of pregnancy and mental well-being. So that's definitely not something we're recommending, but I think CBD in itself is a very interesting avenue in the future, but we don't have the right evidence base at present. Thank you. That's why I, that's why I raised it rather naughtily, but I thought it was best that we address the fact that we, we understand about what's going on, but there isn't enough evidence yet. Now, the, I think we've actually managed to answer quite a lot of the questions in the chat. Um, but uh, one of the things that I, I, I would like to just bring up now um, for Lucy and um, uh, because Hannah mentioned it as well. She, uh, one of the questions that was sent in pre the webinar was, um, can you answer some pains uh, with some questions about how one should manage pain during sexual intercourse? Um, so Hannah mentioned, you know, that intimacy was a problem. Um, and uh, I think this is something that often women who come to the clinic find it very difficult to talk about. So Lorraine and then and then Lucy. Um, so I actually wondered if we go the other way around, because I think Lucy needs to do the gynecological bit first and then I'll... Is that okay, Lucy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so some of the time it is related to some structural cause within the pelvis, such as adenomyosis, endometriosis, or very significant scar tissue from previous infection or surgery. And particularly within endometriosis, that sometimes either surgery to remove that endometriosis or hormonal treatment to dampen down the endometriosis can help with that component of discomfort with sex. But I think firstly, a lot of our patients don't have any of those conditions, or even when we do our targeted treatments for endometriosis, they still have ongoing symptoms. And that's for a variety of other reasons, which we then have different treatment approaches, which I'll let the rain talk about. So I, I, my approach when someone has painful intercourse or dyspareunia, as the, as the medical term, is, is I'm wondering in my head why, what's causing it, what's the driver for it. So I'm going to assume that my gynaecological colleagues, Lucy, has excluded or treated any sort of obvious treatable endometriosis or sort of scar tissue type thing. I want to know, first of all, is there a specific nerve cause for it? Is it an irritated nerve? Is it an altered wind up of the nervous system? In which case we sort of go down the route of injection therapy or perhaps um, or the antineuropathics. More often than not, that helps. But actually, the thing that fundamentally helps the most is physiotherapy. And that just comes back to this basket concept where your 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 pelvic floor is just such an intricate meshwork of muscles that just go into spasm all the time. And, and that, that really is one of the main generators for pain. And so that's why one of the first line treatments and therapies for any sort of dyspareunia should actually be assessment by a pelvic physiotherapist to look and relax, uh, to look and do relaxation. Um, that's often difficult. There sometimes becomes a little bit of a psychological component, but to my mind, because people will maybe get a little bit anxious or worried about something that's going to cause pain, but that, to my mind, is is, is a very small element of it. And the, the physiotherapy is, is 80% of the work that will actually help improve symptoms. Sometimes things like lubricants can help as well. Um, if dryness um, becomes an issue, but um, or topical estrogens, if, if that's appropriate, but but more often than not, it's the physiotherapy that makes the big, big difference and improves symptoms. Thank you. And there've been a couple of comments or a couple of questions and one that was submitted before about the link between pelvic pain and leg pain. And I think that Lorraine's very helpfully sort of emphasized to the audience that there's this very complex network of nerves in the pelvis. So they come out of the bottom of the spine and they go through the pelvis and then some of them obviously have to go down to the legs. So that's what we call radiating pain. Lucy, any comments that you wanted to make about that leg pain? 
Um, well, I think often as if there is wind up of certain nerves within the pelvis, you then get other nerves being irritated. So that neuropathic component of pain can be very strongly linked to it. But I think, again, going back to this musculoskeletal contributions to pain. So getting all these trigger points within the sort of myofascial um, uh, areas so your muscle layers and the sort of the tendons that overlie them. So that's why physiotherapy can be very helpful again for that. And also, I think that's important to emphasize to people that um, uh, to be the people listening that sometimes your muscular skeletal system is trying to compensate for something else and subconsciously you're trying to prevent something happening and you can then actually get muscle discomfort and knots and and feeling very tense and uh, and very uncomfortable as a result of your sort of subconscious protective mechanisms mm -hmm. Caroline, is there anything in the last few minutes is there anything you'd, you'd like to add in here uh, about what you've heard or your particular journey because we you know we couldn't have had this conversation without your contribution so thank you again is there anything you'd like to I'm going to give you the last word so to speak um I think the only thing that I would add on just as a as sort of to share what's helped for me is when we were speaking previously about um how when you when you go to your GP and how to present your symptoms I found that what helped me a lot of the time was writing it all down beforehand um, so I went to multiple appointments with everything in one sort of little notebook and I covered in that the symptoms that I was having, the range of severity that I would have them on, what it was impacting, how it would impact it and sort of what my life looked like at the time, just so that I could present sort of everything in one um, rather than trying to maybe possibly leaving the appointment thinking, oh, I, I didn't, I've not covered that or I've not covered that. So that's definitely something that I would recommend to people who are either go, like going to their GP for the first time or going to any appointments is to take the time beforehand to write it down just so that in that appointment nerves don't take over and you you don't forget anything sort of thing and you can present it all like that. No, I think that's really important. And please, to audience, don't worry when neither neither Lorraine or Lucy or myself are going to think, oh, my God, if you get out a notebook from your handbag, actually what we think, oh, this is going to be a really constructive conversation because this lady has actually thought through what she wants to talk about. And I always think, you know, it may be a lengthy consultation, but I always think it's going to be much more productive. And something else that somebody mentioned earlier as well, and that is, it's really good idea, I think, and I hope you agree, panellists, that when you're going along, if you've got multiple problems, to try and prioritise them, because sometimes it's not going to be possible to tackle everything um, first or at the same time. So I often ask ladies who are coming to see me, well, of all the problems you've got, which is the one that you want me to make disappear if I possibly can first? And then if that's going to be you think incompatible with the next one down the list or the third one down the list, say, well, let's try one and then let's see if we make progress with that, then we can progress on to the others. So Lucy, a comment, you look as though you're about poised to say something there. No, I, I just I would totally agree about it's understanding what the main priority is for that patient. So we don't want to make assumptions about what we think is going to be their priority when we get the referral letters, it's asking them going, what's important to you. And it's really important. And that's why I think the notebook Hannah is such a useful thing because we can then say well that's really interesting and thank you for sharing all that with me which is the thing that you really want to sort out and as Lucy said I mean I may have think oh well she wants to be to sort out these painful heavy periods and actually in fact that's not what you want at all you want the fact that you've got a pain radiating down the front or the back of your leg yes so very important so um, I think that the audience I think well they are very appreciative there's lots of people saying how very helpful it has been um, can you use TENS before speaking to consultants, Lorraine? And can you answer that one for me? The tens yes, I, I would recommend TENS as one of my favourite things in the whole wide world. Um, I put it on my shoulders and it feels like I'm having a massage in the evening. So there's lots of different settings and it's a fantastic handbook, handbag tool that you can carry around. So yes, um, please use the TENS as much as you can and need to. That's lovely. And then you can go and buy them in boots. I know because I was in there the other evening and I saw them. So you can go and buy them. They're very safe. And also some of those massage guns that you can get um, are really very helpful as well, aren't they? So, um, so, so many, many questions, but all very, very positive. Yoga and Pilates. Yes, I think, again, anything that's going to give you relaxation. Lorraine. Yes, I was just going to say just watch with yoga 
Pilates is excellent. Yoga, the kind of down dog hold for five minutes for as long as you can, putting your ankles behind your ears. No, but anything that's going to strengthen your core and work on relaxing your muscles is, is, is good. Lovely, jolly good. So remember that core musculature and keeping fit and always that's going to make you feel better, uh, not just physically, but also I think emotionally as well, keeping fit. So um, thank you again very, very much indeed, Hannah. Thank you for coming along. You can see by the chat that you've, um, you've inspired lots of people to ask questions and I hope, and you've given them a lot of help as well. And thank you to my two experts, uh, Lucy Whitaker. Good luck with the rest of your studies, Lucy. I look forward to meeting you again because we bump into each other quite a lot. And that's always a great pleasure for me. I always think, oh, the future's going to be quite happy if we've got people like this uh, in our specialty. And Lorraine, thank you. I, I suspect that there are a lot of people on this call today who just wish we could clone you and put <laughs> a copy of Lorraine Harrington into every city in the country. Um, thank you. Questions about... Uh, where there are other clinics such as the Expect Edinburgh one and if you go on to the Wellbeing of web, uh, uh, Women website um, you can get lots of uh, directions and, and signposts. You can also go on to the NHS website as well because they've got some good sections there about endometriosis clinics and, uh, and pelvic pain. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, excellent webinar, an amazing webinar, fantastic thank you. What a wonderful team you are. Many, many thanks. Completely invaluable. You're all amazing women. This is a very nice way to finish off, isn't it? Just <laughs> um, really wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, and it goes on and on and on. In fact, there was, as I finished saying that and saying I was closing it down, another 34 messages came up. So thank you. It's been really, really appreciated. And thank you so much for agreeing to be recorded so that many, many more women uh, can enjoy the benefit of your expertise. Thank you again. So I'm going to give everybody a clap. Well done, you. And uh, I look forward to welcoming you back to a Wellbeing of Women webinar in the near future. And please, if you'd like to donate to our research, we can carry on funding wonderful projects like the one that Lucy's doing and the one that the studies that Lorraine has been involved with, which has allowed them to become so expert and to um, really find ways in which we can treat this really, really painful uh, problem of um, pelvic pain. So thank you again. And I'm going to wish everybody a happy rest of the day. Thank you again and hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Bye.